Greetings in the wonderful name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. It is always a privilege, as I always say, to, to be here. Uh, it's always a privilege to be anywhere, to be honest with you. And, uh, <laughs> but I'm honored. And I, I will say this, my wife and I, we've really enjoyed our time here. This is our second year with you. Uh, you guys are so warm, so, so inviting, so uh, welcoming. And my wife and I really, really appreciate it. We're in a lot of places. Some places not as friendly, I'll be honest with you. Uh, but you guys are warm-hearted and means a lot to us. Uh, I'm going to do, as I always do, I'm going to make, make some announcements. We have some materials back at the uh, book table. And uh, uh, yesterday I taught on uh, end-time deception, and also uh, I, I blended deception in the church. So both of those uh, messages, you find what we talked about uh, yesterday morning, uh, dealing with the end-time deception. Uh, last evening I dealt with uh, false Christ. Uh, this is a message here that goes in-depth to look at the false Christ uh, and I talk about the most diabolical of false crises, false Christ in the media. Uh, this morning, I have a, a strong word. Uh, it's called the reality of hell. Uh, this is a message that's not taught a lot, but it really needs to be taught. And again, we're going to see this. Normally, I, I try not to mention that I'm a teacher on hell a lot of times because when I do, Christians don't show up. And, uh, <laughs> but I'm glad you're here. You, you guys are hungry for the word. And uh, you're going to find out this is, really is a great message. It really is. Uh, I think every believer needs to understand this place because it's, because it's real. Uh, and the Bible talks uh, a lot about it. I mentioned last night we have a book on the table. It's called Charting the End Times by Dr. Tim LaHaye. Uh, a wonderful book of prophecy. Uh, a great chart. I mean, a great chart book. Uh, uh, I do like chart books because I use a chart teaching. I'm going to use our chart this morning. Then we have the 12 DVD set. Again, uh, it's a foundational teaching on Bible prophecy. A wonderful study. Uh, give you a, just a great solid foundation uh, on DVDs uh, related to Bible prophecy. Then we have our website, which is www.according2prophecy.org. We have a Facebook presence as well as a Twitter account. Then we also, uh, we're actually on what's called the Truly Network. Uh, you can go to trulynet, uh, truly.com. Uh, we have a channel there. We also launched our YouTube channel, uh, which you can also go to from our website. Uh, and then in a few uh, months, uh, we're going to have a, a weekly program on his channel uh, network, and you can get all of those online. And uh, we're really honored uh, for the exposure that the Lord has allowed uh, our ministry uh, to have. Now, my message this morning is the reality of hell. I want you to bow your hearts with me as we ask the Lord this morning to, to bless, bless his word. Let me move this out of, the, out of the way. It wants to stay there, but I, you don't see it. Okay, that's good. All right, let's bow our hearts. Father God, we love you, and uh, again, it's always a privilege and an honor to first stand before you. Lord, what an honor. The God of heaven have chosen us to be his sons and daughters. Lord, it is an honor to stand before your people this, uh, this morning. And I ask today as we go into your word, Holy Spirit, I ask that you would open the scriptures to our hearts. I ask this morning that you would remove doubt, remove confusion, that you would clarify uh, 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 the scriptures regarding this place called hell. Lord, give us a burden in the latter days for the lost, for those that don't know you, that are on their way there. And Lord, help us, O oh God, to proclaim this message to a dying world. Now, Lord, we love you. We give you all the honor and all the glory. Thank you for what you're about to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. The reality of hell. And again, this is a message uh, is not taught a lot, but it really should be. I want to start off with a verse here in uh, Psalm 9, verse 17. The psalmist wrote, he says, The wicked shall be turned into hell and all nations that forget God. Again, this is one of those messages, as I shared earlier, that a lot of people don't want to deal with or don't like to hear. But the Bible tells us a lot about it, and we're going to see that uh, this morning. Uh, there's a lot that, that God wants us to know about it. I want to quote here Pastor Mark Ritlin. He wrote this regarding hell. He said this, none should be allowed to shout about hell who haven't whispered in terror, God save me. None should be allowed to mention hell to the lost without tender, desperate concern in every word. And none should be allowed to preach a sermon on hell unless it ends with an invitation to choose heaven. Hell is a reality. Everybody likes heaven. Everybody wants to go to heaven. Nobody wants to go to hell. Uh, we're going to see this morning what the scripture teaches. Now, this is one verse I'm going to give you here. Proverbs 11, verse 1. 
This is one verse that I use and apply toward every message that I hear. Everything about God is balanced. Proverbs 11.1 1 says this. It says, a false balance is an abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. And, and what this says is this. Uh, everything about God is balanced. You know, he's a, he's a God of love, but also he's a God of justice. He's sovereign. Uh, when we spend so much time on the love of God and not, not the justice of God, we go into a false balance. Or we spend so much time on the judgment of God and not look at the love of God, we go into that false balance as well. God so loved the world. We know that, that he gave his only begotten son. But we also know that God is sovereign. He's a judge. God does not like sin. So we have to have a balance. We need to see uh, both perspectives of God. He's a God of love, but he's a God of justice as well. So we must always keep that balance. In everything that you hear, uh, look for the balance of God. Now, again, I'd like to bring in our chart. And this, this morning, we're going to deal with this part of the chart, dealing with the realities of hell. We're going to see, again, what the scripture teaches. We always uh, I like to let you know we're in the church age, that dispensation of time where Christ is using the body of Christ. The next major event is that event of the rapture of the church. Uh, and again, I'm looking forward to that, uh, that wonderful, wonderful experience. I want to quote Dr. Albert Mueller again uh, in his book called Hell. This is a great book you might want to get. It's called Hell Under Fire. Uh, I was really surprised when this book came out because really you don't find books written on hell. Uh, when I bought it, I couldn't believe it. I just said, wow, I'm so glad to see this. Listen to what he said. He said, the sudden, sudden disappearance of hell amounts to a theological mystery of sort. How did a doctrine so centrally enshrined in the system of theology suffer such a wholesale abandonment? What can explain this radical reordering of Christian theology? He said, the answer to, to this mystery reveals much about the fate of Christianity. In the modern world and warns of greater theological compromises on the horizon. He said, for as the church has continually been reminded, no doctrine stands alone. Each doctrine is embedded in a system of theological conviction and expressions. Take out the doctrine of hell and the entire shape of Christian theology is altered. See, it becomes a false balance when you take out this part of it. You know, the message of hell is a counterbalance in the gospel. You got to have it. Jesus believed in hell so much that he went to, uh, he, he went to the cross to give us uh, 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 life, eternal life from it. He believed in this message. Now, I'm a topical teacher. I'm going to give you eight topics, and some I'm going to hit really fast. I'm going to define the definition of hell. What is hell? I'm going to show you some false views of hell that's taught today. We're going to find out who created hell. Many people will be surprised. We're going to see that hell is not a parable. Then we'll look at the five compartments of hell. We're going to see that hell is eternal. Then we're going to find out where is hell located. You ever wonder where is hell located? The Bible is clear. It tells us where it's located. And then last, we're going to see the end of Satan in hell. So first, we're going to define hell, the definition of hell. What is hell? The existence of hell is irrefutably taught in the scripture as both a place of, of the wicked dead and a condition of retribution on unredeemed mankind. The word carries the connotation of doom, hopelessness, and futility. That's true. Hell is not a really popular message. Uh, it's a very weighty message, but again, it's in Scripture, and we need to understand it. It means uh, its meaning is clear. It represents a place of future retribution, the abode of the wicked, a place of punishment. The Bible tells us about hell. Hell is therefore both the condition of retribution and a place in which the retribution occurs. In both these aspects, the three basic ideas associated with the concept of hell is reflected. One, an absence of righteousness. Two, separation from God. And three, eternal judgment. We need a reality of this place called hell. I can tell when a Christian don't understand hell by the way they live. I can understand also when people don't believe in hell by, by their burden for the loss. You don't have a burden for the loss if you don't believe in hell. This message will give you a burden. Now, as I've shared throughout the, the conference so far, whenever the church don't deal with biblical issues, 
the devil and the world will always try to deal with it. And the devil, whenever he tried to uh, interpret biblical, biblical e events, he never give it to you correct. Case in point, I'm going to show you this. Look at this magazine. This is U.S. News and World Report. I was in the grocery store one day, and I was coming up, and I looked. I could not believe this magazine. I was so shocked, I bought two copies of it because I couldn't believe it. This is U.S. News and World Report. Hell, a new vision of the netherworld. Now, this is the world's concept and idea of hell. Look at this. The devil is in hell with his Bermuda shorts on. He has a drink in his hand. Here you have a demon right here. He's uh, serving a couple. I mean, they, they, they stretched out, you know, on these lawn chairs. And the devil, the demon there is giving him some, some wine or whatever. In the back, they're playing volleyball. Can you imagine doing all that and all that heat? Do you think that's, listen, uh -uh. this is a lie of the enemy. I've heard people say, man, I'm going to hell. I'm going to have a wonderful time down there. I said, you, you are deceived. I'm a, I'm, today we're going to destroy some of the misnomers about hell. Uh, some of the false understandings about hell. We're going to destroy it today. Here's another one, another Time magazine. Look at this. What if there's no hell? Uh, this was by, uh, uh, taken from the book by Rob Bell. Talking about love wins. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that as we see it. But when the church don't deal with biblical issues, especially prophetic issues, the devil will always present a counterfeit to the world. People want to believe that there's no hell. They really want to get it out of their, out of their conscience. So, looking at false views, let me quote some of the things that this article talked about. On page 45, it says, With fire and brimstone out of fashion, modern thinking says the netherworld is, is not so hot after all. Do you think hell changes because these, these scholars say that? Look at this one. Page 45 again. An influential Jesuit magazine with close ties to the Vatican it says, hell, the magazine declared, is not a place but a state of a person's state of being in which a person suffers from deprivation of God. A few days later, Pope John Paul II told an audience at the Vatican that rather than a place, hell indicates the state of those who freely and definitely separate themselves from God. To describe this god forsaken condition, the pontiff said, the Bible uses symbolic uh, uh, language and figurative, uh, figuratively portrays in a pool of fire those who exclude themselves from the, from, the, from, the, from the book of life, thus meeting with a second death. That is just convoluted goobly gob. It makes no sense. He said hell is not a place it's a symbolic form, all right? Page 50, it said, many, theologi many theological thinkers continue to reject any notion of hell that, uh, that smacks, smacks of the supernatural. For them, hell's imagery, frightful imagery, is pale by the flames of Hiroshima and the Holocaust. The only real hell, they say, is the here and now. Have you ever met a person said, I'm living in hell now? Man, this is hell now. What are you talking about? I say, listen, brother, this is heaven compared to hell. I don't care what you're going through today. No matter what you're going through today, it's a whole lot better because your day can change tomorrow. Today is a whole lot, uh, uh, this world is a whole lot better than the eternal judgment of hell. Look at this, page 47. The temporal hell. Once we discovered that we could create hell on earth, says one scholar, it became silly to think of it in a literal sense. Does that change it? Moreover, the Pope declared that hell is not a punishment imposed eternally by God, but is the natural con uh, consequence of an unrepentant sinner's choice to live apart from God. The thought of hell, said the Pope, must not create anxiety, oh yeah, or despair, but is a necessary and healthy reminder of freedom. This modern and more benign view of hell, scholars say, reflects a shift of much of Christian theology during the past 150 years, away from literalism and physical imagery toward more metaphors and symbols. And here's the problem. People don't want to understand the reality of this place, so they try to explain it away. But we're going to see today that the Bible is quite clear. 
Hell is a literal place that you want to avoid. And God has done everything in his power to help you avoid that place. Now, Time Magazine from Rob Bell's book, What If There's No Hell? Rob Bell writes, he said, hell is not forever and love wins in the end. He said, and all will be reconciled to God. All won't be reconciled to God. No, man has a choice either to accept God or to reject him. Everybody would not be automatically uh, 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 reconciled. It's a choice. When you identify with Christ, you will be reconciled. But if you don't, you won't. And the judgments of God await you. Now, who created hell? I like this. Because, you know, saints, all my life I grew up believing that the devil created hell. As I shared earlier, every time I saw the devil, he had a red slicker suit on and a pitchfork in his hand. I remember as a young kid, I watched a movie by Sammy Davis Jr. Sammy Davis Jr. in this movie went to hell. And while he was in hell, he was working for the devil. And one of his jobs in this movie was to throw coals on the fire. So I was a little kid watching this program, and I said, you know something? When I go to hell, that's the job I want. I'm going to keep them sinners burning. I mean, a little kid, you know, I'm, I'm thinking, my mind, I mean, I'm impressed by, by what I'm seeing thinking that the devil was in hell. Well, I'm going to give you an understanding tonight, uh, this morning, saying that Satan did not create hell. Hell was created by a loving, a loving God. Hell was created by God. Hell is a perfect judgment of God. Hell is the perfect wrath of God, unmixed with mercy, unmixed with love, it is the perfect judgment of God for rebels. I want to say to you also that, that the devil had nothing to do with hell other than God creating it for a judgment of him. Yeah, look at this. Jesus told us in Matthew 25, 41, then shall, he say, then shall he say also to them on the left hand, Jesus said, depart from me, ye cursed into everlasting fire. Listen at this, prepared for the devil and his angels. Hell is a prepared place. Hell was created by God Almighty for the devil and his angels. I want to say this to you this morning, saints, that hell was, was never prepared for mankind. Mankind created in God's image. Man's, mankind is God's ultimate creation. Man was not created for hell. But when Adam sinned, Father God had to accommodate the fall of man. Look at Isaiah 5. Very powerful text here. Isaiah 5, 13 and 14, it says, Therefore, God says, Therefore, my people are gone into captivity because they have no knowledge and their honorable men are famished and their multitudes drive with thirst. God says, Therefore, hell have enlarged herself and opened her mouth without measure and their glory and their multitude and their pauper, their fame, and he that rejoiceth shall descend into it. Hell was not created for mankind, but when Adam sinned, I believe here God had to accommodate the fall of man. And hell has enlarged herself for the rebels. It's a real place and we're going to see it. Now, hell is not a parable. And the reason why I, 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 I like to title this section that, because a lot of times, uh, as David shared this morning about the Jehovah's Witness coming to his house, uh, a lot of times I have them come to my door as well. And uh, I don't let them know that I'm a, I'm a teacher of the Bible or a prophecy teacher. I just, I let them come in. I let them get going. I let them get real deep in what they're talking about. And then I say, can I get my Bible? And they say, yeah, yeah. And then it's on. Uh, we, we, have, we, have a, we have a wonderful time. <laughs> well, the Jehovah's Witness are notorious to teach that, 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 that hell is a parable. And when you make hell a parable here, I'm going to read a verse for you, a few verses here. When you make hell, hell a parable, that means you need to explain it. So when they try to explain it, they, they get all, all wacky with it. But I'm going to show you today. Uh, how, many, how many know the account of Luke 16? Luke 16, chapter 19. Jesus gave the account of a man going to hell. Now, you may look in, in your Bibles, in the headers of your Bibles, uh, you get to Revelation, I mean, Luke chapter 16, starting at verse 19. Some of the headers there say the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. 
I want to say, if your Bible says it's a parable, scratch that term out, parable, because Luke 16 is not a parable. We're going to see it. It's an actual account of a man going to hell, and I'm going to show you that it's not a parable. We're going to start here in uh, chapter 16, verse 19. Jesus said, and there was a certain rich man. He's talking about a, a, a real person, which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus. Personal pronoun. Jesus is literally identifying an individual. He said, Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar who was Lazarus died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. This man was carried to a literal place. And I'm going to talk about that when we look at the compartments. He, was, he died, he was buried, but the angels took him to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried, and in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments. And see the father Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in these flames. Now, here's the account here. Lazarus died. The Bible said the angels took him to Abraham's bosom. We'll learn what, what that place is. The rich man died, and he went immediately into hell. And where he went was a place of torment. While he's there, this man had a, had a change of heart. This man, we're going to see, uh, you, know, you, know, you know, when a person goes to hell, Hell corrects all of your wackiness. Yeah, yeah. You know something? There are no atheists in hell. No atheists. None. Because when an atheist goes to hell, he becomes a believer in God, but it's too late. If you got warped views about, about whether God is real, uh, in hell, they believe in God. You got to hear me. All of their wacky theology. Uh, here, uh, this man is in hell. He's burning. And now this man's going to have compassion for somebody else. Look at this. Verse 25, but Abraham said, son, he said, remember thou in thy lifetime, you receive good things and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he, Lazarus, is comforted and thou art tormented. Uh, this rich man, he said, he said, Father Abraham, send Lazarus to me, uh, let him dip his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flames. And Abraham said, hey, son, remember he said, remember in your lifetime. See, it's in your lifetime while there's breath in your lungs that you get things right with God. It's while you have breath in your lungs, you receive or you reject uh, God's love advance, Jesus Christ. This man, he didn't get it right. Uh, this, we're going to see also that this is perfect timing because uh, the law was still in effect. This man, he didn't submit to the Mosaic law. There was no atonement on this rich man. Now, he didn't go to hell because he was rich. He went to hell because he didn't repent. And we're going to see that in a few minutes. But now we see this man here, he, 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 uh, he, he is being tormented, but where Lazarus was was a place of comfort. Abraham said, he said, and besides all this, between us and you, there's a great gulf fixed, so that they which pass from hence to you cannot, and neither can uh, they pass to us that will come from thence. Then said he, I pray thee there for Father Abraham, that thou would send him, send Lazarus to my father's house. This man has compassion in hell. But it's too late. He said, for I have five brethren that he may testify unto them, lest they also come to this place of torment. This man knew where he was. Some teach soul sleep. When you die, you, you stay going to a, place, a state of soul sleep. That's not true. The rich man died. He was buried. But in hell, he lifted up his eyes, being in torments. And this man knew where he was. He had full memory about his past life because now he's thinking about his brothers. He said lest they come also to this place of torment. Abraham said unto him, they have Moses and the prophet. This is so key in this text. Jesus, as he's given this account of the rich man and Lazarus, he, he is right on uh, 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 in prophetic timing because he hadn't paid the price yet. So the Mosaic law was still in effect. And Jesus is talking, telling this man, Abraham said, your brothers have the law of Moses. They need to be obedient, obedient to the to uh, 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 atonement. They need to be obedient to the sacrifice. Your brothers have the laws of Moses. He said, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, nay, Father Abraham, but if one went back from the dead, if they saw a miracle, 
If my brother saw a miracle, they will repent, implying he didn't repent. And he said unto him, if they hear not Moses and the prophets, or if they don't hear the law, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. So Luke 16 here is an actual account of a man going to hell. The rich man went to hell because he didn't repent, not because he was rich, but he didn't repent. He didn't submit to the Mosaic law at the time. It was still in effect. When Jesus gave the account, he hadn't died yet. We know that's true. Abraham, because of his obedience, he had to have been obedient to the law of Moses. Because Jesus told him, he said, I mean, not Jesus. Uh, Abraham said that where Lazarus was, which was Abraham's bosom, was a place of comfort. You know, in the Old Testament, before uh, Christ paid the price, the, the Old Testament saints, when they died, their bodies were buried, but their spirit and soul went to Abraham's bosom, which was a place of comfort. Many scholars call this the paradise of old. It was a place of comfort in the underworld. That was a great gulf fixed between both places. Uh, so those in Hades and Sheol could not come, and neither can those in Abraham's bosom go there. And we're going to see as we go a little further. Now, I'm going to give you one little thing to show you that Luke 16 is not a parable. I had this couple, it was a Joe Witness couple, a husband and wife, a young couple came to my house and they got to talking about Abraham's bosom and telling me that it was a parable and they was trying to explain it away and I just let them get deep into it. And then I said, can I ask you a question? And they said, yes. I said, okay, let me ask you this question. I said, do you believe in Abraham? Oh, yes, the patriarchs. You believe in Moses? Yes, Moses, Moses, yes. I said, well, let me ask you this. If, if, if Luke 16 is a parable, why did Jesus use Abraham and Moses in the text? And if you just saw their count, their face went from happy to sad. They said, you know something? Uh, uh, why did Jesus use Moses? They realized that Luke 16 is not a parable anymore. It's a reality. Yeah, yeah, Moses and, and Abraham, these men are not fictitious characters. Uh, uh, there's much Bible history about these men. Hell became a reality to those Jehovah's Witnesses. They left sad. Boy, they were really sad. I said, Lord, just help them. I prayed for them. Lord, help them. Lord, let the seed of the word begin to, begin to cause questions in that, in that doctrine to get them out of it. Hell is not a parable. It's a reality. Now, I will give you a parable. And I'm going to show you this. I'm just going to give it to you. Jesus did give a parable about hell, but the end result is still hell is hot and, and, and there's flames. In, in the book of Matthew, chapter 13, verses 24 through 30, Jesus gives the parable of the wheat and the tares. Uh, in, in verses uh, 36 to 43, he actually defines or gives understanding of the parable. And the meaning of this parable points to a literal hell and not a figurative one. You know, signs and symbols, they always point to a reality. And again, hell, we're going to see as we go forward, it's a real place. Hell is real. It's no parable. It's no fictitious place. Uh, it's a reality. Now, let's look at the five compartments of hell. And I believe the Bible gives us this. We're going to see this so clear. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to bring in our prophecy chart here. And we're going to see Abraham's bosom. We're going to see Hades and Sheol. We're going to see Tartarus. We're going to see uh, the bottomless pit and then the lake of fire. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to define each one of those. So the first one we're going to look at is Abraham's bosom. Abraham's bosom is the place referred to as the paradise of old. It was a compartment where all the righteous dead of the Old Testament were kept, uh, kept. There was no torment or suffering in Abraham's bosom. It was simply a place of holding until the death and resurrection of Jesus. Jesus paid the price by shedding his blood. At the resurrection of Jesus, Abraham's bosom was emptied and removed from the heart of the earth and is now located in heaven. All the captives were set free and resurrected. Now, again, uh, the Old Testament saints, because of the atonement, they were covered. So they couldn't go to a place of torment or suffering. Now, I'm going to give you a good example. You remember when Jesus was, on, was at, at Calvary? He's on the cross uh, between two thieves. Jesus told, um, he, he told one of the thieves that, that, asked, that cried out for mercy. He said, this day you will be, be with me where? In paradise. Now, let me, I'm going to ask you a question. Where did Jesus go at that moment? Did he go up to, to the third heaven? I mean, he, did he go to God's abode? No, he didn't. Based on scripture, the Bible says, as, as Jonas was three days and three nights in the belly of the well, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth. I believe Jesus took that thief to Abraham's bosom. Yeah, he had to. Because scripture says in Ephesians that he must descend before he ascended. Yeah, 
Jesus took that man to Abraham's bosom, which was a place of, of comfort for the redeemed until the wrath of God was satisfied by the blood of Jesus. So Abraham's bosom was a place of comfort. And if you notice here, I have it right before the cross. See, Abraham's bosom was before the cross. Now, when Jesus died and paid the price, the Bible says today when a Christian died, that we are what? Absent from the body and what? Present with the Lord. Today, when we die, we, they bury our flesh, but our spirit and soul immediately goes into the presence of God. Now, let's go a step further. Let's see the next compartment. Hades and Sheol. The term Hades is the Greek form of the word hell. The definition of the word Hades is as follows. It is a place or state of departed souls. The term Sheol is, uh, is the Hebrew word for hell. The Hebrew language, the word Sheol is defined as Hades or the world of the dead. As a subterranean retreat, its associates and inmates, the grave, a hell, and the pit. Hades and Sheol is the Greek and Hebrew form of the word hell. Hades and Sheol is where the spirit and soul of the damned go before the judgment. When the rich man died, he was buried, his body was placed in the earth, but his spirit and soul immediately went to Hades and Sheol. And the reason why I use the term Hades and Sheol because when the Jehovah's Witnesses come to your house, they try to impress you with Greek and Hebrew terms to throw you off track. And they tell you that, 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 that uh, hell is Hades and Sheol and all it is is the common grave. No, it's more than the common grave. Hell is a place of judgment. When a person died, their spirit and soul goes to this place of torment. They're there tormented in their spirit and soul until the last resurrection. And what's going to happen? God's going to resurrect, resurrect, resurrect them. We're going to see that as, as we go forward. Now, let's go to the next compartment of hell. Uh, it's called Tartarus. Tartarus is the Greek form of the word hell. It's a, it is the compartment where fallen angels are kept, reserved in chains of darkness until they are judged by God and are cast into the final hell or the lake of fire. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4 gives us the account. Jude uh, 1, 6 also talks about it, but I'm going to read uh, Peter. Peter said this, for if God, this is Peter, 2 Peter, I mean Peter 2 or 4, he says here, for if God spared not the angels that sin, but cast them down to hell, the Greek term there is Tartarus, and delivered them into chains of darkness uh, to be reserved unto the judgment. Now, these angels were those that went on assignment, and I really believe they tried to uh, 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 inhabit or, or get into the seat of man. And what happened, they overstepped their, the boundaries that God allowed the devil to go, I mean, I mean, to operate. And, you know, God is even fair to the devil. Uh, once Satan became the god of this world, uh, Satan had some boundaries that God allowed him to, to operate in for a season. But I, I believe this, saints, that, that because God told him that the seed of the woman was going to bruise his head, I believe the devil tried to get into the seed of man. And these angels went on assignment, and God judged them. The Bible said these angels are judged, and they are now today reserved in Tartarus. It says reserved unto the judgment, or unto the day of judgment. God's going to judge them at the white throne judgment. That's Tartarus. Now, no men go there, these fallen angels there, and it wasn't all of Satan's angels. Satan still have angels and imps and demons that are doing his bidding, but these angels are right now in Tartarus reserved unto the judgment. The next compartment of hell, the abyss. The abyss or the bottomless pit is the compartment of hell where Satan will be bound for 1,000 years during the reign uh, of Christ's millennial kingdom. Revelation chapter 20, verse 1 through 7. Also during the time of the great tribulation period, it is where the locust-like scorpion creatures will come to torment mankind for five months. Revelation chapter 9, verses 1 through 11. You know, I've heard it been taught that uh, when those locusts are released under the trumpet judgments in chapter 9, uh, I heard one, one, one prophecy teacher said that those locusts were U.S. glass bottom helicopters. They said because the way the scripture described these locusts, the Bible said they had face like men, they had tails like scorpions, and God's going to give them the ability to sting men in the tribulation for five months. The Bible says men will seek death and death will not be found. For five months, God will allow these locust-like uh, uh, creatures to vex and torment men of the tribulation. 
So they tried to explain away by calling this U.S. helicopter. They said, but John, he couldn't ex explain what it was, and, and he saw the vision of these U.S. helicopters because they had glass bottom and they saw men's faces. I said, we got a problem with that. And the problem is where these locusts come from. The Bible is clear. These locusts during the tribulation will come from the place called the bottomless pit. It's the same place where Satan will be bound during the millennial reign of Christ for 1,000 years. They're gonna, God's going to loose them from this place. These are tormentors that God's going to allow to vex men during the tribulation. You ought to read the account of Revelation 9. It's, it's heavy duty. The abyss will not be the eternal home of Satan. He will be loosed from this prison to be judged and then cast into the lake of fire forever. Now, let's go to the last compartment, which is the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the eternal home of all sin and rebellion. Another name for this place is called Gehenna. At, uh, at the close of the great white throne judgment uh, of God, this will be the home of the wicked. Revelation 20, verse 11 through 15, gives us the great white throne judgment. Satan will, will be there for all eternity and will be tormented day and night forever and ever, having no rest. Also, Hades and Sheol will be cast into the eternal hell. Those uh, who inhabit Hades and Sheol will be resurrected to face the great white throne judgment. Then they will be cast into the lake of fire, in the end, the wicked, Satan, fallen angels, and sin will have their part in the lake of fire forever. Now, look at the chart. I'm going to show you something here. A lot of people don't realize this, but this is a true statement, and the Bible bears it out. Uh, in Hades and Sheol, this is where the unredeemed are now who have died. But at the last judgment, a last resurrection, God is going to resurrect the spirit and soul of the unredeemed. You read the Gospel of John chapter 5. Jesus said this. He says, marvel not at this. He said, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice. Those that have done good unto the resurrection of life, that's the redeemed, and those who have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. You know, the unredeemed person is going to leave Hades and Sheol and be resurrected into his body to stand before the white throne judgment. When a man stands before the white throne judgment, he's going to stand before God in his flesh. You know why? Because God made us triune beings, spirit, soul, and flesh. You're not a complete person when you're disembodied. God is going to judge man in his flesh because man sinned in his flesh. And what's going to happen at the white throne judgment, God's going to judge and vindicate his judgment on the unredeemed. And every man and woman and even child who's reached the age of accountability, who rejected Christ, who rejected God's love advance, they will be turned away and cast into the eternal hell, the lake of fire. You know what I'm saying? This message gives me such a reality for the lost. You know, I used to give up on people. I don't give up on anybody no more because I understand this message. I don't have an enemy that I want to go to hell. Some of us, some of you may be praying for people. You may have family members. You've been praying for 20 years, and, and you're tired and fatigued. You're worn out with praying for them. You know, I've been praying for Johnny all these years. I'm just tired. Go to hell, Johnny. No, don't, don't do that. Have you ever been mad and you told your loved one, go to hell? Let me tell you, if you've got a reality, you, you won't send anybody to hell because hell is a reality. Hell is so real that Jesus died on the cross to, to, to cause men to, to miss that place. I don't care how long you've been praying for your loved one. Continue to pray for them. Don't give up on them. It's but for the grace of God and the mercy of God that you are saved today. There's no one that I give up on. You remember Saddam Hussein? When Saddam Hussein was alive, I, I was on the bandwag, uh, bandwagon of killing him. I said, kill him. Hang him. That's an evil man. Hang him. Hang him. And one day the Lord said, son... I want you to pray for Saddam Hussein's salvation. I said, huh? I said, what? Jesus said, son, I died for Saddam Hussein. I said, oh my God. God gave me a revelation. The wickedest man, Jesus died for him. You know, if Saddam Hussein would have received Christ, Saddam Hussein would have been a different man. He would have been a different man. Oh yes, he would have changed. It gave me reality. It gave me a different perspective about people. 
You know, we look at people, we judge them. We, we look at people and we throw them away. We cast them off. You know, Jesus don't cast them off. We need a reality of hell. This place is real. And again, men are going there. Now, is hell eternal? There's many debates. Some people say that hell is not eternal. They say the flames of hell is not eternal. Uh, Seventh-day Adventists teach that when a person goes to hell, they'll burn up. Uh, I got an article published by the Seventh-day Adventists. It, it teaches, they gave 10 reasons to reject eternal torture. One of their reasons, they said, to believe in eternal hell is to make God a monstrous agent of Satan. I said, they don't understand hell because God created it. How can you make God a monstrous agent of the devil when God created that place? No, no, no. It don't make God a monstrous agent. It makes him a sovereign God. So I'm going to give you some scriptures. Just give you some verses. Look at this. Matthew 18, 8. It says, to be cast into everlasting fire. How long is everlasting? How long is everlasting? Matthew 25, 46. And these shall go away into everlasting fire punishment. The punishment of hell is everlasting. Revelation 20 verse 10, talking about the devil, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. You don't burn up in hell. This is an eternal judgment. Revelation 14, 10 and 11, and the smoke of their torment ascend up forever and ever, and they shall have no rest day nor night how long is that, saints? Forever. It's real. Hell is real. We play with it. Hell is real. It's so real, saints. Jesus understood it enough to take our sins for us. You know, hell sent Jesus to the cross because he didn't want us to go there. Hell is real. We need the reality of our Savior. Let me show you quickly how hell is real and hell is eternal. I'm going to show you something just so simple to show you that it's eternal. In Revelation chapter 19, verse 20, this is when Satan is cast into the lake of fire. Uh, no, I'm sorry. This is when the Antichrist and false prophet is cast into the lake of fire uh, from, from the battle of Armageddon. I'm going to read the text here. Revelation 19, 20. John wrote, and the beast or the Antichrist was taken and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that received the mark of the beast and them that worshiped his image. These both, the Antichrist, these both, Antichrist and false prophet, were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone. Now look at the chart here. This is, this is the thousand-year millennial kingdom. This is the second coming of Christ. And right at this point, the Antichrist and false prophet will be cast alive into the lake of fire. Antichrist and false prophet won't go before the white throne judgment. These men will go straight from the Armageddon theater right into their eternal judgment, the lake of fire. This is the first time humanity is introduced into the lake of fire. Antichrist, false prophet, cast. So what's going to happen? They will be cast into the lake of fire. Uh, what's going to happen here? At the beginning of the millennium, Satan will be bound in the bottomless pit. So Antichrist and false prophets in the lake of fire. Satan is bound in the bottomless pit. He's, he, he will then be released at the end of the thousand years. And look what happens. At the end of the thousand years, when Satan uh, is released, the Bible said that God's going to judge him and cast the devil into the lake of fire. Look at the text, Revelation 20, 10. It says, and the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire. And brimstone, listen at this text, where the beast and the false prophet are. You know, Satan does not come to lake of fire until a thousand years later. The Antichrist will be in the lake of fire a thousand years before Satan. And when Satan gets there, they are still there. Here, the scripture reads, where the beast and the false prophet are, present tense. That shows us that when they go there, you don't burn up. You don't, you don't, you don't annihilate. They are still there a thousand years later. A uh, false prophet and the beast will be there to meet, meet Satan when he comes. And shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Hell is real. Hell is eternal. Where is hell located? I think Bob is quite clear. 
Hell is located in the center of the earth. I really believe that because the Bible, the Bible shows us that. And I'm going to give you one example. Uh, back in the Old Testament, there was a, a, an amazing event that happened. Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, these elders of Israel, these men of renown, came uh, against Moses' authority. They told Moses, Moses, you take too much upon yourselves. And they thought that Moses, by, by, you know, by him choosing Aaron as his brother, uh, it, it was nepotism. You know, it's a family thing, Moses. Moses, uh, we are men of renown. We can do what, do, do, you know, do what they do as priests. And God told Moses, Moses, all right, tell them to get their censers and burn incense. Tell them to go get it. Then Moses told him, he said, okay, fellas, I'm going to tell you something. He said, uh, if you die a natural death today, you're going to know that I have not been called of God. He said, but if God do a new thing today, <laughs> you're going to know that I'm called of God. Look what happened. Numbers 16, verse 32. The Bible says, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up. This core, Dathan, the Byron, their family, their houses, their cattle, everything. Swallowed them up, their houses, and all the men that pertain to Korah and all the goods. Verse 33, and they and all that pertain to them went down alive into the pit. They went into Sheol. The Hebrew there is Sheol. And the earth closed upon them and they perished from among the congregation. Can you imagine what Israel felt like when they saw that? Moses said, if I'm not called of God, you'll die a natural man's death. But if I'm called of God, God's going to do a supernatural thing. And as Moses finished talking, God opened the earth. And they fell. Then the earth closed up. And the Bible says great fear fell upon the house of Israel. I guarantee you fear fell upon them. But it, it lasts for a little while. They start murmuring again. But it showed that hell is in, is in the heart of the earth. Not only that, as, as Jesus, the Bible says, he would go into the heart of the earth as, as did uh, Jonas in the belly of the well. Three days, three nights into the heart of the earth. Scripture is clear. It testifies that hell is in that place. Let me go a little further. I want to, because of time, I want to I go to this last part here. Uh, Matthew, Matthew, Matthew 12, 40, it says, For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the belly, in the well's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Again, proving that hell is in the heart of the earth. Uh, Ephesians 4 said about Jesus, uh, it says, what, what is it that he first, that he also descend first before, I'm sorry, he descend first into the lower parts of the earth. Jesus had to go down first before he ascended up. Revelation 3, verse number 3, talking about uh, uh, no man worthy, it says, no man is worthy in heaven, nor in the earth, neither under the earth was able to open the book Neither to take the book thereof. This is talking about chapter 5 when uh, it said no man was worthy to, to take the seals out of the hand of God. But it's amazing. It said no man in heaven, no man in the, uh, in the earth, and no man under the earth. Yeah, people in hell right now, believe it or not. Hell is real. Now, we're going to close with this last part. The end of Satan. I'm going to share something with you as I close. For me to be a prophecy teacher is amazing. There is a God in heaven. Believe it or not, saints, all of my young life growing up as a kid, I was taught that if you study the book of Revelation, you would lose your mind. Now, that's really rough for a young kid to get. Because when I, when I got saved in my young adult life, uh, I studied every other book in the Bible but the book of Revelation. I didn't want to lose my mind. I'm, I'm going to leave that prophecy stuff alone. And all of a sudden, God called me to this area of ministry. And I really believe God called me to show me, son, you know, the devil's trying to hide something from you. You know, when I started studying Bible prophecy, I found out the devil's in. And I want to show you that as we close. I love this. Book of Isaiah 14, verses 12 and 14, it says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cast down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? For thou have said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Scripture says here, yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. They that see thee shall narrowly look at thee and consider thee saying, is this the man that caused the earth to tremble? 
that made the kingdom shake. The, the Bible says that when, hell, when Satan goes to hell, the Bible says that the dead will be stirred up for the devil at his coming. Let me tell you, Satan has a day coming. You got to know this, saints. Satan is not in hell. The devil don't control hell. Uh, the evil didn't come from hell. You got to hear me on this. Hell was created by God. Hell, I'm going to say something going to shock you. Hell is holy because it was created by a holy God. Hell is a perfect judgment for unredeemed mankind. It's a place separated by God for rebels. Satan didn't create hell. Evil didn't, didn't come out of hell. No, oh, no, no. Evil didn't, evil, evil didn't come out of hell. No, no, no. Hell was created by God for evil. Look what it says here. The devil is going to hell. Revelation chapter 20, verse 10, my favorite verse in the Bible. Uh, I would encourage you, mark your Bible. Mark this up. Revelation 20, 10 says, and the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. This is a prophecy for the devil. You know, saints, when the devil starts messing with me, I start quoting this prophecy on him. Yeah, I start reminding him. You know, saying that the word of God says, you're going, you're going to hell, devil. Yeah, I, I remind him of his prophecy. Hell is a real place. It's for rebels. It's for those who, 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 who reject God. It's for those who, who don't want God's love advance. You know, many people that stand before the white throne judgment, they're going to know that God did everything in his power to save them. Salvation is so simple. Just believe. Just receive. The Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, they shall be saved. Salvation is so simple. When men stand before God and God have to reject them from his presence, they're going to know, God, I was a fool. You know, hell is full of good people. Good people in hell. Sweet little grandmothers, you know. They cook that, you know, make, make those nice Sunday pies. You know, they make them nice look. Little sweet little grandmothers. Hell going to be full of sweet little grandmothers who hate Jesus. The reason why I say it like that because I want you to have a reality. All kind of people are going to hell. You can't judge people how they look. They may look sweet and, and, and docile and, and just gentle, but if they hate Jesus, they're going to hell. Young people are going to hell. You know, young people today are rejecting Christ. They reach the age of accountability and they are making a will, I mean a chart, a willful choice to reject God. Young people are going to hell as well. And they're going to give an account before God. Hell is real, saints. Hell is no joke. I was teaching the Bible college. I taught some pastors, and one of the pastors came to me and said, Brother Perkins, he said, you know something? He said, I and a bunch of other preachers used to joke about hell. We used to talk about when we go to hell, we're going we're gonna to have a house party. This preacher told me, he said, I will never, ever joke about hell again. I had five young ladies took my class at the Bible college. The, uh, the president of the college came and said, Brother Perkins, we have five women who want to take your class, and I think that they are lesbian. Do you mind if they come in your class? I say, I don't mind. Let them come. I did a series called Introduction to Bible Prophecy. One of the sections in that series was the reality of hell. Now, what I did, I didn't, I didn't deal with the homosexuality. I didn't condemn them. I didn't call them sodomites. I didn't, I didn't, all I did was preach the reality of hell, the scripture, the very words I'm giving you now. At the close of that study, those five women came and they challenged me. They said, sir, we got to talk to you. They said, what you taught today, we have never heard before. We are part of a church that says we can be gay and go to heaven. What you taught, we've never seen before. That night, those ladies repented of their lifestyle and received Christ as their Lord and Savior. And let me tell you something, those women were on fire. It's just, it was unbelievable to see the transformation in these women when they received Christ. They became radically saved because of the word. I didn't condemn them, I just preached the truth of the gospel and the gospel convicted, the Holy Spirit convicted them and they received Christ. Radically saved. You got family members like that, love them, but give them truth. Don't play with them. Love them, but give them truth. And the word of God changed those women's lives. It's real, it's real. I want you to bow your hearts this morning. Father, we love you. And Lord, I know this message is not a happy one, but Lord, it is a reality. 
Lord, help us all, dear God, to get a, get a different perspective on this place. Lord, let us see the harvest the way you see them. Father God, give us your heartbeat. Give us your heartbeat concerning a lost world. Forgive us, Lord, for our apathetic heart regarding this judgment. Forgive us, Lord, for not wanting to hear the message that is so, so evident in Scripture. Lord, I pray today that as this message settles in our heart and spirit, dear God, I pray, Lord, let this message, dear God, give us a burden for the unredeemed. Now, before I close this, I must make this appeal today. The Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, they shall be saved. It's that simple. You call upon him, he'll give you eternal life today. I can't preach this message without opening up for an altar call. I mean, I cannot preach this message without, without giving you a call, a, a chance to receive him. We take for granted a lot of time in these coming that everybody is with the Lord, but somebody is here who may not know him. Well, all hearts are bowed. Today, if you're not born again, I want to say don't leave this place without Jesus today. If you're not born again, I want to say today, today is the day of salvation. While all heads are bowed, while we're praying, you say, Brother Perkins, I realize today I'm not, I'm not with Jesus. I'm not, I'm not born again. I'm not with Yeshua. I need him. I'm not born again. But I want to be. I want to choose heaven today. I want to choose God. I want to believe in the Savior. Today, I want eternal life. Just simply raise your hand. Just, just simply raise your hand. Lord, Lord, save me today. Just simply raise your hand. Today, you'll have eternal life. Is there anyone? You're not born again. You're not a Christian. But you want to be. You want Jesus to be the Lord of your life. You want to identify with his death, burial, and resurrection. Is there anyone? Just raise your hand. Don't debate about it. Don't fight about it. Just accept him. Today is the day of salvation. Is there anyone before I close this prayer? Is there anyone before I close this prayer? I see a hand. So beautiful. Thank you. So beautiful. Lord, right now, I thank you, dear God, for that heart. And Lord, I pray to God, let, let this be the beginning, dear God, of a new, new life in Christ. Lord, I pray, dear God, as he raised his hand, dear God, Lord, uh, crying out to heaven, Lord, today, let his life change forever on. And Lord, today, we again, we thank you for this message, Lord. Help us, oh God, to reach a lost world. Give us your burden to reach a lost world. And Lord, we thank you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.